So let's talk a little bit about the substantive work of uh, promoting women's rights and women's voices. You talked a little bit um, about it throughout um, our interview about many of the different issues that women face that other minority groups face, including um, within international institutions. So if you have to pick one most important issue faced by women for you at this moment, what would that issue be? And how does your current work attempt to address this or um, intersect with this issue? Yes, you, you know, when I, when I heard that question, you know, my mind went to, you know, where are the gaps? Um, where are their serious violations? But at the same time, I think of one of the, the things I've said often to myself, more than anyone else, and sometimes aloud, um, that I want to know what are our, as women's imagined lives. What do we see as our possibilities? Um, so I recognize that the harms we face are debilitating, and I have worked around many of those harms. And certainly in my part of the world, the combined impact of violence, poverty, conflict, um, have certainly damaged women's ability to choose, um, to have, as we would say in the inter-American system, their own life project. Uh, but increasingly for me, it's less the issue and more the empowerment or voice. And I think in the end, what has been most value for me, valuable for me is the possibility that the work you do, regardless of the topic, can contribute to women's empowerment, women's increased ability to decide for themselves and to have more of what they wish for their lives possible. Uh, and, um, you know, I think of the work which we did over a decade with trans women in Ghana who faced um, criminalization um, in the Georgetown area. Um, and of course, um, unending discrimination in the health sector, in the educational sphere, um, in housing, um, in simply walking on the streets. And I thought a lot about not simply the work we did, but how alongside us, they created their own movement and community of activist work, um, which sometimes coalesced with ours, but certainly developed its own agenda separately from us. I think far more important than the litigation we did, which did end up before the highest court of appeal in the Caribbean, the Caribbean Court of Justice, a successful outcome, an important one, was that empowerment. Um, and I think um, if the process of our work um, has the ability to create more space for different groups of women who face some of the harshest vulnerabilities in our communities and societies um, to determine who they are and who they want to be in community, that that has been for me the most important possibility um, and thing I could do as a Caribbean feminist. Creating more space for local women to empower themselves. Absolutely. And sometimes women, you know, so for example, the trans community Mm -hmm. um, is working cross borders, um, working across borders in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and globally. And so movements will determine what communities are valuable to them. But for so many of us, we have become who we are in community. And engendering some space, which sometimes is a space of stepping back, not forward. Uh, so that others can have space to build the communities um, which are valuable to their own transformation. I think that's a critical part of the work I care about more. In promoting and um, facilitating and doing this type of work, do you think the regional and international and, and maybe the domestic human rights regime that, that we have right now um, is sufficient in offering that space and in promoting that space? Mm -hmm. 
it you know there are limitations <laughs> you know there's there there's a wonderful moment where Kenji Yoshina says, you know, law will never fully apprehend us. Uh, we can't expect and hope that legal structures are going to make sense of our entire humanity. Uh, that, but nevertheless, law still has value and those structures um, in the name of human rights institutions, domestic courts have had value in giving voice to some, um, creating more space for dialogue um, for some. But I think it's important for, for us to appreciate that the overall work which we must engage in has to go beyond legal structures and institutions and um, the related human rights ones. That's very insightful. Thank you so much for sharing. Like you said, the law itself is not enough. It is one of the many tools that we have, and it's one of the many tools that a local and international advocates have to work with at this moment. Are there any particular trends and challenges that you're seeing right now, especially as a result of recent events and the situations that we are in globally? Um, and how have you seen activists responding to those trends and challenges, especially when, as you've talked about, what we have is often very, you know, insufficient, but, but we have to work with the tools that we have. Yes, I think one, if you, you know, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, if you are in North America, or you are in Brazil, um, if you're in the Caribbean, you may ask questions as many feminists have about our use of criminalization to address gender inequalities. This, I certainly think one of the major um, questions raised by contemporary feminism is, well, has criminalization served the ends of gender justice well? Um, and I think that's an important question all of us are asking around the world as we are attempting to advance questions um, of gender justice and often working with templates uh, which have strong criminalization as part of them. You know, but I think there are distinctions across the world uh, between places um, in which it is not working well, as you can see because of the over incarceration of, for example, black men in the United States, um, or alternatively, places in which it's not working well because there's no state accountability. In other words, no one is being criminalized. Um, and I think there's a need to think a little bit more about how the debate um, takes shape in different parts of the world where the criminalization issue is one um, which has materialized um, in forms of incarceration which are uh, deeply, deeply unequal and racialized and other places um, in which the state um, does little or nothing. And I'm not suggesting these are entirely different spaces or no overlaps between them, um, but the criminalization debate, I think, uh, forces us to ask how is law working in diverse spaces? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's an ongoing question, um, which many more of us and many more of us in the global soul um, need to be a part of. That's definitely one of the issues that many members of our student community are, are working on and are, are caring about deeply, not just in the United States, but also um, in, in other countries and regions. Maybe to segment um, into this last question, if you have a young woman lawyer who is very passionate about, about using their skill sets to do something, say, um, if, for example, to fight against incarceration based on a person's race, color, ethnicity, um, what, what advice would you give to that person starting out in this field? It might be to say that it is, a surprisingly hierarchical or perhaps not hierarchical field. 
Um, so if you are junior, you're going to walk into spaces where seniority means something. And I would say, despite those hierarchies, um, certainly in some cases, one has to contest and challenge uh, the ways in which those, are those hierarchies are detrimental um, to you as a young professional. But the advice I'd give is the advice I gave earlier. And it is to focus not only on who you work for, but who you work with. Um, building vibrant, long-lasting communities, diverse communities, of persons who share your goals, but don't have the exact same ideas as you, who through your joint and collective initiatives and efforts, um, you can see your way from one challenging moment to another, um, from one opportunity to another. Um, folks who will be supportive of you, who will guide you, um, but will be with you in what for many will be a lifelong project of work. And to listen and to observe, but also to take space when it's necessary. Absolutely. And sometimes when you're listening and observing, you might be talking separately to your community and receiving guidance and wisdom. Uh, so the space of listening is a dynamic space. It's, um, it's not a static space of absolute um, silence and non-movement. It is one in which one takes care in one moment in one place and learns from another. Um, one speaks in one space and makes noise as sometimes one has to make noise. Um, and one carefully works through and determines what strategy and action we take in another. Strategic work um, often requires thoughtful, quiet moments as well. Thank you That's so much. From a quiet person. <laughs> Thank you so much for these insights, uh, Ms. Robinson. I'm sure you know our students, but also our broad readership will find your your experience, your insights, and particularly your advice extremely helpful. Just like I have found them extremely helpful. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much.